I'm one with the force, the force is with me. I'm one with the force, the force is with me. And I'm one with the force. Welcome to the Dharma of the Force, a podcast about the spiritual and philosophical side of Star Wars. If that puts you off, it's just words. And if you think that's all a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, even better. We cannot widen our horizon and grow by never challenging what we believe, and we should always be suspicious of those who tell us what to believe. In some Buddhist traditions, listening to Dharma talks is a spiritual practice. It's not meant to give answers per se. It's an exercise in looking at questions and elaborating on them and finding the truth within yourself. So in that spirit, let us look at today's topic. Understanding George Lucas. No, I'm not saying I come even close to remotely being a creative genius like George Lucas, but I can still relate to some of the reasons that made him do things a certain way. Like I said in the introduction, I released a couple of albums. As such, I have been at the mercy of financing as well as the other people involved. Back then you couldn't do everything yourself on a computer and even now it's best to leave some things to experts. My first album was somewhat of a disaster when it comes to the surrounding circumstances and how it turned out. I'd gladly go back and change things, even did a special edition a few years later. Heck, I'd even re-record it if I could. But something weird happened. People liked it. Some people at least. But back then I was going in naively and that was before the internet. My generation didn't practically grow up to be scrutinized. So when some reviews in music magazines ripped it apart because they didn't like it or get it or didn't like the genre, uh, it really had an impact on me. It psychologically affected everything I did after in a major way. I distanced myself from the debut, tried to make things better next time and got defensive, even aggressive in interviews and and openly attacked the other bands we were compared to at the time. It took me a long time and some serious soul searching and distance, professional therapy probably could have sped this up a bit to be able to see things subjectively. Yes, there are flaws, obviously. But there's also a lot of unjust prejudice from some critics. In these situations, you often fall victim to being labeled prematurely based on what you stand for. I had a conversation with a fellow musician from the same genre at the time who was told by a critic he didn't even listen to the album before writing his review because he just doesn't like that sort of thing and just assumed how the record would be. And something that we need to remind ourselves is that most of the critics are not even the target audience, not even remotely. It is their job and to be fair, they're often forced to review tons of stuff they're not interested in and it leads to fatigue. Of course, you can't and shouldn't only let fans review a product that would result in a very distorted perception and end up as nothing but advertising. But maybe someone who at least has some knowledge of what they're dealing with. And then there is this emperor's new clothes aspect to it. Some things are perceived lowbrow, so of course if you consider yourself of good taste, remember what I said about how we all mostly stick to our tribes, you will feel obliged to look down on those things. Your opinions often reflect on how you want to be perceived from your peers or So, you like caviar, champagne and classical music? You must be so sophisticated. And as such, in the 70s, you wouldn't have considered a space western Oscar material, so obviously Star Wars wasn't going to be a critically acclaimed movie. The good reviews didn't come from the established movie critics and their recommendations, they came from the fans. Just another piece in the puzzle of how Star Wars changed the movie industry. Speaking of fans, so, you release something, you worked hard at it, you lost sleep and money and it's not what you had in mind and you had to make compromises, too many compromises, but you're lucky and it becomes cult, the fans take ownership. 
You deliver the product and the rest is out of your hands. It becomes its own thing. You can try, but ultimately you have no influence on how you're perceived unless you spend loads and loads of money on it. At some point, this fan ownership leads to some form of entitlement and expectations. The idea of what the product is and where it should lead will differ. As an artist, you will want to explore new themes, push boundaries. As a fan, you will often want more of the same. Please don't add to me as the kids say. The Last Jedi is still Star Wars and not a documentary about the macro layer of midichlorians. Changes in style rarely work and the older the better as every musician who has heard I like your old stuff over and over again can attest to. So you can even do it like, I don't know, ACTC and do more of the same forever and it works or it doesn't work. Or you create a colorful costume drama about how political intrigues shape the destiny of a young boy and face the backlash. According to the psychology of persuasion, if a lot of people like it, it has to be good. That's why companies spend a lot of money on ads. That's why influencers buy fake followers. It used to be over 1 million records sold, 1 million fans can be wrong stickers on albums. But it's now much worse. There is this sense that social media accounts with a lot of followers and likes are somehow better and post truer content than others, which is why companies buy fake followers and likes. Oh, this product has 2 million followers, must be good. This account has 200 followers, ah, probably shit. Some of us might still canvas old vinyl stores to find gems that no one knows, but the majority thinks like that. Who gains from this? Not the artists or fans, only social media companies. So if you see 10 tweets by accounts that might be bots and just one tweet saying something positive, you might consider this product a complete failure. Add some clickbait YouTube videos of people making money of literally nothing to that and your opinion is swayed. I've said it before and I will say it again. Why are almost all the new theatrical Star Wars movies so polarizing? Because social media companies benefit from outrage. They will lead you down a rabbit hole of engagement because they want your attention and time. You might have heard that one before. If a product is free, chances are that you are the product. And all the, the real reason why and we finally know why videos are self-serving grab for your attention. And don't think for a moment that all the proof that Lucasfilm so-and-so articles are anything other than clickbait for revenue. It's about as useless and pointless as a bought best movie of the decade review printed on a poster. Find your own truth somewhere in the middle and don't let them poison the waterhole. Like most online magazines, we often don't have the time to make up our own mind and just go by whatever we heard somewhere. And that's the danger with everything these days. There's so much stuff on the internet. There are so many motivations to consider. Most of us are not aware how big an impact it can make. I've heard that one before. Yeah, right, as if it will change anything if I go on the street and protest or if I go and vote or something like that. Change always begins within yourself. Don't wait for the world around you to change. Our world has become a minefield. I understand that it's easier to look away. It's always easier to point at other people demanding change. Activism often ends at one's own doorstep. These Chinese must stop with their dog meat festival. Eat less bacon for my health and the climate. How dare you? On the off chance that I sound like a crazy conspiracy theorist now. But that's okay as long as I don't get a yelly fit like Alex Jones, right? Your opinions can be weaponized. I'm not saying someone is benefiting from you not watching a certain movie, but Disney is a big company. A big loss can affect a country's economy, so maybe another country or company might benefit from that. Oh, no? Maybe? No? Okay, I'm taking off my tin for a head now. That was once again just a thought experiment. Thanks for sticking with me.
And then there is the concept of group polarization. If you already kind of have an opinion, chances are if you're repeatedly exposed to certain opinions, it will reinforce and even strengthen your opinion. Why do you think the rise in radicalization coincides with the rise of social media? Don't become a pawn, free yourself. So that's that. That's the time now. If George Lucas already faced harsh criticism after the prequels when these echo chambers were in the infancy, what sort of hate would he sign up for now? If you google George Lucas good, it will seem as everyone thinks he's a genius. If you google George Lucas bad, it will seem as everyone hates him. You know, search and you will find. Your focus determines your reality. And then there is of course parroting. It's easier to repeat what you heard rather than coming up with your own opinion. And opinions are also prone to trends and fashions. For the people affected, bad feedback will always be perceived worse than the good one. Every public figure masochistic enough to read reviews will tell you that the negative ones linger longer. And it is completely distorted reality. For every negative opinion there are thousands who are satisfied and see no need to speak up. And negativity tends to snowball. Someone reads another negative opinion leading to delusions like everyone agrees with me. There's a beautiful phrase used in Germany in response to right-wing protests. You are not more, just louder. Don't fall for the dark side trap here. Negativity is infectious, but it's also deceptive. Being louder doesn't make you right. My grandma used to say, he who has to yell is wrong. Don't trust anyone who has to yell their opinions at you. It's funny that people tend to say if you publish something, you have to be able to take the feedback. As if there would be no place for fragile or sensitive artists and then we are surprised when someone shockingly commits suicide. I think we should rather learn to articulate our emotions better and create a safe environment for everyone. I can say, it is not for me, I'm not the target group, but I admire and acknowledge the time and passion that went into its creation. But if I say fuck that shit, that shit sucks, it will once again tell you more about my incapability of articulating myself than anything else. In school, I was often invited to join discussions in religious studies. I don't know if they have that where you are, but we have either Catholic or Protestant classes. I had surprisingly good conversations in these classes and one thing that always stuck with me, I have to credit the Protestant priest of my hometown for that, he argued, thou shalt not kill, should be interpreted as you shall not cause any harm and words can cause a lot of harm. In my introduction episode I talked about my time working as a communication coach and I often spoke about the magic power of language and that we need to be mindful of the words we use. If we say don't think of the pink elephant, it doesn't matter that I say don't. I magically projected the image of an elephant into your mind and that's a miracle. So if someone were to say someone should storm a public building, what are you now thinking about? No matter on which side of the political spectrum you are, I will to the very least have made you think about the topic. There's a lot of power in words and language. We maybe all had days in which someone totally killed our mood by saying something negative. And on the other side, a nice experience or some nice words from a barista at the coffee shop or something totally made us feel uplifted for a while. So from what I gather, George Lucas is a rather sensitive and introverted artist. From his point of view, he first delivered a subpar product and people got mad at him and he improved a few things. He then saw himself losing control over the creative direction and when he tried to get involved again, people complained about Ewoks or merch. If you don't want a studio to dictate the direction of a movie, you have to finance it otherwise and merchandise is a perfect way to do so. And then he was finally able to tell the first three chapters of his saga that it has become the norm to bash the prequels. Like an inside joke that never went away. That must have felt real nice. I mean, it's nice that people now discovered the redeeming qualities and got over their prequel hate, but after being whipped for 20 plus years, a band-aid and a sorry won't cut it. 
So when it was time for the sequel trilogy, in a way that must have been like getting a tattoo or running an ultra marathon while you're at it, you're like, oh man, that takes long and doesn't really feel nice. This is definitely my last one. But once a bit of time has passed, you feel the calling again. But if it requires a sacrifice of 10 years and more, you ruin Star Wars until the rest of your life, I think it's quite understandable that you step away and let others do it. That must have been the hardest decision of his life, but no one's ever really gone. His visits to the Mandalorian set have proven how much he's still involved and will probably forever be. I mean, I did three reunion shows with my old band so far. It is part of your life, of your identity. And in time, you're able to see things through the eyes of the fans. It's not that bad. For its time, it's remarkable. A million fans can't be wrong. I understand George Lucas. If you want to support me or this podcast, don't send money. I don't have a Patreon. Find a charity of your choosing and donate. And do yourself a favor and switch off your phone, disconnect, and just sit in silence for a few minutes. Close your eyes and... Breathe. Just breathe.